my series of uh, the blogs called Love Ultras. I'm John Kinston and this is episode 15. I thought for this episode I would look back on my experience of running the Hardmores 110. I've done it twice and uh, I enjoyed both of them and they were quite different experiences. The first time I ran the Hardmores 110 and uh, basically for those who don't know the race they're based in North York's uh, John and Shirley Steele are the race directors and they've been running them for just over 10 years now and they're great races uh, all based around that area there's the um, uh, they started with 110 the year before I did it in 2008 and now they've built up to a number of races so they have marathons half marathons and 10 k's I think it's about seven of those throughout the year and then they do a series of ultra races a 30 mile race uh, 55 the 110 and 160 and also the 60 and this year they had a the celebration of the of the Hardmore's uh, races they had a 200 mile race and they're introducing an 80 mile race next year as well so the whole series of races but the year that I did it in 2009 it was my first experience of running an ultra outside of Scotland I started in 2007 and I ran the, the Fling and the West Harlem Way that year. The following year I did the same. And then in 2009, when I was 50, I decided to try and do five ultras, uh, which was a big step up for me at that point. So I did the Fling, the West Harlem Way and the Devil's Race. And each of those were probably my best performances. Three races together. Uh, I was sub 10, uh, nine hours 49 for the Fling. I was my, did my PB in the West Harlem Way, 1951, 59. And then in the Devils, I was uh, six hours, 54 something. So each of those races have gone really well. And that year, the Hardmores 110 was in September. So it was about six weeks maybe after the, the Devils. I'd done a 60 mile training run, which looking back probably wasn't the wisest thing I've ever done. But I wanted to get the feel of running right through the night, which I'd never done before on the West Harlem Way. So that was, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I was hoping to do a recce of the course, but it just didn't work out. So I ended up um, not having run at all a step on the Hardmores route, which follows the Cleveland Way. But I was looking forward to it. My good friends, Neil and Caroline Gibson, were willing to come down and support me. The race started on a, uh, the, the Friday night and um, I could get the day off work, but Katrina couldn't. So uh, Neil and Caroline volunteered to come down to support me. And I thought, well, I'll do it this year and I'll do my best. And maybe it will be a recce for a, another year. But anyway, we got down. We left about half 11 or so from Paisley, drove down, met up in Helmsley. And there was 19 people doing the race that year. So it was a very small race, really, um, just getting going, which in a sense had its challenges as well. Um, I was feeling good. I was feeling good shape. I said I had a great year, and uh, I was confident. But I didn't know what the route was like. I knew the first half. I'd spoken to Murdo McHugh and had done the race the year before, and the first time it was run, and we went over the maps, and he gave me a good idea. So that was helpful. But I, in my mind, I was thinking the first half is the hilly bit, um, probably similar to the West Harlem Way route, and that was probably true. And then the second half from Saltburn to Filey, I thought was going to be a fairly easy run down the coast. And, but it didn't quite turn out like that. Anyway, so we set off and it um, was light for about an hour and a half and then it went into the dark. And I was running with people, st setting off pretty steady, felt pretty good. And then halfway along, maybe after about 20, 30 miles, I joined up with a guy called Dave Camis, who's the, I think he's the first one who's completed a thousand miles in the Hardmores races. And anyway, I spent a lot of time with Dave and he was a, a great a great character, become a good friend. We got lost a little bit going through Geesborough Wood, but not too much. And um, we got to Saltburn pretty well bang on what I was hoping to and feeling in pretty good shape. Met Neil and Caroline there, I've met them at each of the checkpoints. It was light, it was getting light by now, it was the, the early morning, so we sort of set off. And I was thinking, well, I've done the hard bit and now it's going to be the enjoyable bit running down the coast. And it sets off like that. You climb up a little bit out of Saltburn, you get onto this coastal path. You've got your sea on the left and you're running along this nice grassy path. And I thought, this is going to be fine now all the way to Filey. But I didn't realise there's lots and lots of steps and ups and downs. And every little inlet, there's a down, which means there's a climb up the other side. And it was tough. And um the accumulation of the year probably and that 60 mile training run I did about four weeks before started to have its effect and I was starting to really struggle 
Uh, it was a beautiful day, it was quite warm. I remember getting to uh, Whitby and then uh, getting up down the steps there and then that was, you know, but st still going out, still going okay. And then, but after that, it just got really hard. My feet were sore and I was just tired. I think I'd probably gone off too hard, um, but I was starting to feel the effects of it. And um, Runswick Bay, um, just before Robin Hood's Bay, I think that's what I went in and I, I, I knew I was in a bit of trouble. I changed my shoes and Neil said he would come with me from then on. And um, Dave went off and he actually ended up finishing third and had a brilliant race. I was pleased for him. But from then on, it was hard, it really was. Big, long, long climb up to Ravenscar. I saw that, so that's where Neil joined me. And it was took me ages and I kept, you know, I didn't know when it was gonna come and it was just difficult. Went through Ravenscar and Neil joined me then and ran with me the last 35 miles in and or walked. I remember we had a little competition. Every time we came to the steps, we'd guess how many steps it was down and how many up. And Neil seemed to have this uncanny ability of being able to get it almost spot on every time. So I wasn't even winning that competition. But we sort of kept on going, kept on going. And eventually we reached um, Scarborough and it was about nine o'clock, half eight, nine o'clock by now. It's dark, starting to get dark in September. And we walked away down the uh, the prom. Caroline met us and said, oh, that there's no checkpoint. The, um, the guy had to leave. <laughs> so there was no checkpoint even. Um, I remember Neil getting the fish and chips and I got something to eat. I, I wasn't fish and chips, but I remember going into the toilet and just feeling pretty grotty and um, came out and we set off and the prom just seemed to take forever to get round. And we got to the end uh, of the prom and could have hadn't wrecked it and I, I didn't quite know the way. And anyway, we basically spent an hour wandering around trying to find the way off the, the, the prom. We went up too high too, too high too soon, basically. And I, I decided to stop. I'd done 100 miles. I was tired. It was half 10 by now at night, 10 o'clock, half 10. I was thinking, I, I just, you know, I, I felt justified that we'd got lost. I'd wasted an hour. I was getting cold and it'd be safer just to stop. And at that point, Ian Beatty rang, who'd been ringing me a couple of times during the day, asking how I was getting on. And I started saying, oh, I'm really sore and I've got lost and I'm gonna stop. And I thought he might show a little bit of sympathy. Uh, Ian had dropped out the West Harlem Way earlier in the summer. But no, he just laid into me. And he said, you injured? And I said, no, but I'm tired. And he said, that's no excuse. Think of Deb, she did the race when she was pregnant. Think of this, think of the other, oh, okay. So I thought, well, maybe I should give it a go. And I walked down the walked down the road a little bit. And by then, John Steele said he would come over and show me the way and brought Caroline with him. And Ian rang back about 10 minutes later and I said, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go. And uh, he goes, oh, okay then. And I spoke to him the next day and he said he was gonna ring me every 10 minutes before until he told me I was going. So thank you, Ian. And I think that struck me afterwards. That was a real sign of friendship because Ian knew how much this meant to me and how much I wanted to finish it and do the five ultras in my 50th year. And um, he'd known what it was like to drop out of a race in the summer and regret it, I think. And so he was determined that I didn't do that. So thanks for that, Ian. And anyway, uh, Neil, Caroline, uh, John showed us where the route was and we just came out, say, too early. And um, we had about 10 miles to do, and it must have taken us a good three and a half hours. Pitch dark by now, uh, Neil was getting tired because he'd been up all day, Caroline had been up all day, they'd driven down with me and been through the night. So they were tired, and three of us were sort of staggering our way to, to Filey. And it just seemed to take forever to get there. I remember seeing the lights of Filey way in the distance, and you seemed to be going the opposite or away from it because you went to Filey Brig and then into Filey. When we, I remember there was one point where we stopped and Neil and myself just wanted to have a sleep and Caroline was trying to get us going and trying to keep us moving. But eventually we got into Filey. I remember Neil had a little strop because he couldn't see the way into the, the, the final, the final uh, checkpoint, the finish line. Anyway, we got there and um, I finished the race in 31 hours, 11 minutes, 30, sorry, 30 hours, 11 minutes and for and zero seconds and i was eighth <laughs> so out of 19 so i did pretty well considering even considering what it was like but i must admit i i knew i wanted to come back at some point but i had to leave i had to give a bit of a gap and uh, went back to the west harlem way i had a tough year in that year i think the next year and then a tough lakeland race as well 
And then I got going again in 2013 at a good West Harlem way. And then in 2014, I was really keen to come back and I wanted to put it to bed and to put a, have a good performance and say I've, I've, uh, I've done what I, I feel I can do. And I decided to do the Grand Slam, which John had introduced, which means that you do four races over the year on the route. So the first one was on New Year's Day, 30 miles. And uh, that started at, at that year in Ravers Car and you went down and Robin Hood's Bay and round. It was a great, tough weather in the 1st of January, but I had a good run there. And then in March, it was the 55. And I'd done that a couple of times by that point and had a, a really good run, ran it sensibly and paced myself well and pleased with that time. And then the 110 was in May now, uh, halfway through May. So that suited the calendar a bit better as well. And Dave Trober, my good friend, had decided to do the 110 as well. So we had a couple of recce runs. So after the 30 mile race, uh, the next day we did a, a run as well, getting ready for the 55. And then the key weekend in April, in fact, I think it might have been actually Easter weekend or somewhere around there, that we did a, a, a 75 mile two day run. So we went from Kildale to Filey and then the next day Filey, sorry, to, Whit, to Whitby and then the next day Whitby to Filey. So we covered the last 75 miles and that was so helpful because in my mind I'd built up that run from Scarborough to Filey that it was just gonna be, uh, you know, it was just torture. It was sort of big hills and it was muddy and it was a long way and you, you see Filey and you go on the opposite exit and all these things. And in the recce, the two day recce, we had brilliant weather, beautiful weather, blue, sun, blue sky, sunshine. You could see for miles down the coast and we both just had a really good two days. And that gave me loads of confidence. And that final run from Scarborough to Filey, we were chatting away and it was the end of a two day run and we'd had a great time. And suddenly we were in Filey and I couldn't believe it. And in my mind, I'd built it up so badly. So that was a real confidence boost. And the other thing that I'd really decided to prepare uh, in my preparation that I wanted to finish well, having had a terrible experience in 09 where it was just a real struggle. I really wanted to finish this well. So I knew to do that, I had to start well or start sensibly. And to help me to do that, I'd really got into using the heart rate. So I had a very specific 124, 125. That was gonna be my heart rate for the first five, six hours. And I was gonna keep under that, which meant that I wouldn't go into the red and I would be able to finish well if I started sensibly. So that year there was 61 and by then they'd introduced the 160 as well and that started on the Friday night. So we started on the Saturday morning at eight o'clock. So Katrina came down with me on the Friday night. We camped on um, uh, in, in the, at Helmsley and then we 160 runners went through and they went through during the night and then we started at eight in the morning. And there were 61 people this time so it was a bigger field which meant there was more people around but again, I just held myself back. Um, I've got the, the checkpoints here. At the, at the first checkpoint at Whitehorse, I was 48th out of 61. And then basically the rest of the day, I just worked my way through the field and I, I finished 11th. And I just had such a great race. If uh, Not that everything went perfect, but most things did. I got my pacing right. I got my food right. I knew the way, except for one little mistake. But basically, I was I, I, I was on top of my game and uh, really enjoyed it. Ran with people at times and then other times I was on my own for a good period of time. But because I knew the way, because I'd done these recce runs, I'd, I'd put all my mini splits in. So I knew exactly how far I needed to run for the next one. I knew my mile markers that my, my gold was sub 27, which was probably a bit ambitious but I wanted to give myself a, um, a, a real challenge and my silver was sub 28. And so I was hoping that, or it may have been gold 27 and a half and platinum 27, somewhere around there. But so at sort of anything under 28, I'd be really happy with. Anything under that, I'd be ecstatic. Under 27 would be amazing, but everything would have to go right to do that. Um, um, but it was good to have that, but I was on target and I was going well. And by the time I got to Salt, oh no, I'll just tell you about one incident. <laughs> I was coming into Gisborne Woods and that's where I'd got a little bit wrong with Dave before, and we hadn't lost too much time, but we definitely went a, a high, one higher path, I think. But anyway, I knew the way, Dave had wrecked it with me. We knew exactly where to go. And I was confident that I could do that. Up and down Rosemary Topping, okay. Got into Gisborne Wood and I was pretty confident. And I always remember that on the recce, there was one place we came to 
where you could go straight on or you could go slightly right. And we both agreed that I think the official path is to go slightly right. So I came to this post and there was, there's acorn signs which you follow for the Cleveland Way, but there's also extra signs in the woods. And uh, there was one saying right, and I thought, ah, oh, that's that point. So I went right, but it was about half a mile too early. So I ended up going up and I had my sun toe with the, uh, the, the GPS line on and I was off it, but I was seemed to be parallel. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll just come back onto it. And I didn't want to go back down, so I carried on. But what actually happened is I went back on myself and you can see the picture here of that. I went back on myself and I remember I was on the line now. I could say, oh great, I'm back on the line. So, but I was actually going 180 degrees the wrong way. I was going the opposite way. And a runner came towards me and I said to him, oh, you're going the wrong way. It's this way. He said, no, no, you're, it, you've, you're, you're going the wrong way. And I said, no, no, you're going the wrong way. And he said, look, I live here. I, go, I know these words like the back of my hand. And I go, oh, okay then. And uh, I followed him, I turned around, and I soon realized that, yeah, he was right. <laughs> and I came back to the same point about 14 minutes later, and I worked out afterwards, I'd done an extra mile uh, added on. Now, in previous races, uh, the year before in the Lakeland race, I'd had a terrible time and when I'd got lost, and it really affected me that I'd wasted 15 minutes and I should be further up the field and psychologically. But this time I dealt with it so much better. I decided, right, I've made a mistake. I can't do anything about it. I'm going really well. I'm still on target and uh, I, can, I can make up that time. Or even if, if I don't, then I'd st I can still have a really good time. So by the time I got to Salt Bern, I was hoping to be there. I've got my times here. I was hoping to be there in um, 1305, 13 hours and five minutes. And I was there in 13 hours, 19. So I was basically 14 minutes behind my schedule and it was 14 minutes that extra mile I did so I was quite happy with that that I was back on target and um, Katrina met me there she hadn't I'd, um, I looked after myself until that point and then Katrina was she'd been helping out the checkpoint and then she was going to drive to Scarborough um, have a sleep in the, the B&B and then meet me in Scarborough and run the last of the way in so I set off from um, Saltburn it must have been about um, uh, half nine by now so it was getting dark and I was quite confident it was a bit cool but it was uh, I just put a jacket on and it was fine and I just got myself into a good pace now the next big challenge for this race is getting to Runswick Bay because the route goes right onto the beach and if it's a high tide you, you stopped I think in previous in the, uh, subsequent years John has done an alternative route but at that point if you got to Runswick Bay and the tide was in you had to stop and you might have to stop for two hours. In fact, um, the people after me did have to stop for about two and a half hours. Um, that time's taken off your time, but I just didn't want that um, enforced rest for two hours because I knew I'd seize up if I did that. So anyway, I knew I had to get to Runswick Bay by a certain time and I, and I knew it was going to be tight. So I pushed and I pushed. I probably pushed a bit harder than I would have normally. There's a long sort of two miles run into Runswick Bay and I knew I had to get there, I say in about you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, and it was like a 10K race, but finally got there, Steve Walker was there, he was the marshal, and I said to him, oh, okay, he said, yeah, yeah, you got plenty of time. <laughs> and he said, but if, if the water's in, just come back up. I thought, there's no way I'm coming back up. So I went down and the water was right onto the jetty, so I, I, I could, but I could see head torches on the beach. So I waded through the, the bit on the, uh, the jetty, it was up to my, well over my knees, up to my shorts, so, but once I got through that, there was enough beach to be able to run down the beach and then get up the uh, up onto the this, the high ground again. So I just about made it. I think one of the runner after me made it, but I say the ones after that had to wait for two and a half hours before they could get going. So I was really grateful that I, I got through. So I made it through there, made it through Sands End, and then I remember they climb up to Ravenscar, uh, but I'd done it several times by now, so I knew what was to come. I knew it was a long slog for a mile or so got my head down and got through but I remember just before that climb the sun had started to come up and there was just a beautiful sunrise over the sea it was just incredible and that lifted my spirits um, and I think once you get through the night um, and because the race had started in the morning there was just one night to go through and I knew I was going to finish in the daylight so it was all going to be fine from then on got to Ravenscar and then um, I remember Andy and Sarah was there and they had their sweatshirts from the previous years when they'd done their Grand Slam 
and uh, oh no maybe that was the 60 anyway uh, there was a few people there and uh, but I remember I had quite a bad blister and I decided to have a look at it so I took my socks off and I wasn't sure whether to pop it or what to do so I just put a plaster on it but it, it eased off a little bit and then I knew from then on I had um, I had about uh, five or six hours or so to, to run from, from there, six and a half hours or so. And I knew I could still get under the 28, possibly the, the, the 20, no, 20, yeah, oh, 27 and a half had gone. I, saw, I remember thinking 28 and a half would be fine and 28 would be a real bonus. But I got up and down the steps okay, even though they were tough, my legs were tiring, but I was still moving okay. And I got to um, Scarborough and Katrina met me there. She'd run, she'd run out and another guy was on his bike and was taking some photos. That was nice to see him. And so he got a photo of Katrina and myself. And then we ran, walked to the final, to the checkpoint of Scarborough, had a bacon butty there. And then we set off for the last 10 miles. And I was feeling good. I knew, I knew it would take me around about sort of three hours. Um, and uh, so I just kept a, a good steady pace, got up the hill and run, ran where I could. I remember Katrina a couple of times stopping for a, a wee or to take some photos and then having to work quite hard to catch me up, which, which was encouraging. <laughs> uh, and she was amazed at how well I was moving compared to the late uh, races, uh, the, the West Harlem Way the year before where I'd really struggled to finish, or a couple of years before that I struggled to finish well. So uh, my goal of finishing well was uh, was accomplished. And in fact, one of the things which was, I was most proud of at the end, Dave Trollman finished second overall and had a brilliant race. But I like to look at all the splits and to sort of uh, work out. And my split from Scarborough to the end was one or two minutes faster than Dave's. So that was uh, that was really good. He was easy enough, fair enough, because he was he was secure in second place and wasn't going to catch the first guy. But uh, nevertheless, I still was a minute or two faster than him. So I was I was proud of that. So I came into to Filey, um, and I, and I got to the signpost where it says um, 109 miles to Helmsley and I remember thinking right I've ran 109 miles to get here I've just got another couple of miles to go to get into the, the school where it was then and I had about 30 odd minutes and I thought you know what I could maybe get under 28 hours and so we ran down and uh, went around the campsite got onto the road and I thought yeah I can do this so I was just giving it everything I had uh, and I did, I finished in 27 hours and 58 seconds and uh, 58 minutes, 27 hours, 58 minutes and uh, really pleased with myself and I finished 11th out of the, the, the 61 and I really felt I'd put to bed and I'd done myself justice on that route. I felt I was capable of running under 30 hours and transpired just under 28 and I felt that was a, a, a for me it was a, a great performance and I was really really pleased with that um, I finished second uh, of the super vets the male 50 and the guy who beat me was about eight minutes ahead so that rankled a little bit that if I hadn't lost that 14 minutes I might have caught him but it is what it is and I was really pleased with the time and, and my position and I went on and did the 60 a couple of uh, a few months later and got my uh, hoodie for finishing the um, the Grand Slam and I think I finished second overall in that as well after out of about seven or eight people who, who did all four races so that was my experience of the Hardmores 110 and I've absolutely loved it. I've no doubt that I'll go back. I did the 160 this year um, and I, I'm going back next year to run the 55. Katrina wants to do it so we're going to run it together. And I would like to get my 1000 miles at some point. I think I'm up to about six or seven, 650 or something. So I've got a few more miles to do to get my 1000 miles and my, my own number for, um, in the Hardmores. Um, but I just love the race. I, John and Shirley put on a brilliant race. The, all the volunteers, the marshals are, are brilliant. The route's amazing. And so it's a race which has a special place in my heart. And um, I don't think I'll ever, uh, I know I won't get any faster than the 110. And I'm happy with that because that time I think is a time which really uh, is at, at the edge of my ability. And uh, that was a few years ago. So I'm not getting any faster as I get older. But uh, it's a great race and uh, certainly is one which I'm really pleased to be uh, a part of and associated with. So thank you to John and Shirley. Thank you to all the runners I've run with on the route. Thank you to all the marshals that have helped it make possible. So that's my reminiscence and my lessons and the things that I've enjoyed about running the Hardmores 110.